It's my great pleasure to introduce our, our distinguished panelists. Uh, th thanks, th thanks so much, Tommy. I, I just want to do express my appreciation to the Aspen Institute for having me here for this uh, extremely important topic. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the panelists, and then we'll jump right into it. Uh, so beginning with Tobias Bachela. Uh, can we get Tobias up here, first of all? He, he's a member of the Bundes, uh, German Bundestag, the Bundes uh, 90 Die Grünen. If you would sit right here. Uh, and he's also a coordinator of the Digital Affairs Committee on in the Bundestag. Is that right? Of the Green Group in the of the Green Group in uh, and of the Digital Committee. Yeah. Okay, which is a member of the government. Is in case anyone uh, has forgotten that. Yeah, uh, th thanks for being here. Benjamin Bracke is with us as well. He's uh, Director General of Digital and Data Policy at the German Federal Ministry of Digital Affairs and Transport. And I should mention too, and this, this makes, makes it quite interesting, that before that you spent 10 years with IBM. So you were in the Indeed. private sector and have a view of how things are going with IBM. We're going to be talking a lot about artificial intelligence today, and IBM, of course, is very, very strong in that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And Caroline King, Head of Global Government Affairs and Business Development at the enterprise software company SAP. Uh, anyone in Germany will know who SAP is, but I would just... Just to add to that, I looked it up. SAP does have the highest market capitalization of any company in Germany at the moment, right? So technically the most valuable company in the country. And just one little fact I found out too about SAP, uh, you can tell me if this is true or not, that roughly three quarters of all revenue globally touches an SAP system somewhere. That's beautiful. I didn't even prep you for that. I, I no, no. It's, uh, I, I just thought, wow, that's, wow, that's a lot. Uh, yeah, so back, you know, back offices everywhere have SAP running. That's it. And Hannah Müller is head of the division political systems, hybrid threats, and disinformation at the Federal Ministry of the Interior and Community. I don't need to add anything to that. That no. is just an absolute uh, amazing thing. I know you also have a lot of experience in China, having worked with Germany's uh, Federation of German Industries before that, uh, which also brings some interesting insights to this panel. Semyon Renz is Public Policy <laughs> Director for Germany, Austria, and Switzerland at Meta. And if any of you aren't really sure, you know, Meta, of course, you know this by now, it's the company behind Facebook, uh, also the company behind Instagram, also the company behind WhatsApp. Uh, and these are, these are apps that I don't know how the world would function without them anymore, at least the last two. Thank you for being here. Uh, Jeremy Rawlinson, finally, uh, uh, Rawlinson, rather, head of EU policy, government affairs, and uh, European government affairs at Microsoft. He's based in Brussels. Thank you for coming to Berlin to be with us. Uh, we'll uh, I'll mention a detail about your biography later on. We'll get to that. Anyway, oh. <laughs> thank you all. Um, I'm looking forward to a, to a discussion. We're going to have, I'm going to do a quick thematic introduction and then we'll at, we'll jump straight into the discussion. And at the very end, I hope we'll have 20 minutes left over to get input from all of you. So if you're thinking about questions as we go along, uh, just earmark them and we'll, be, we'll take them at the end. I want to compliment the organizers also for coming up with a really catchy title. Unfortunately, it's not on the, on the board. Oh, there it is. Look, good tech, good democracy. I mean, whoever wrote that could get a job writing headlines, right? If AI wasn't going to take that job away anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll sit down. Let's get started. Um, this discussion couldn't be more timely. Uh, we were just having some, a chat before we got started. And, uh, AI is just the term that we're all is on everyone's mind at the moment. Um, and I say this, this is timely for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, as Amy Gutman, the U.S. ambassador, mentioned earlier, uh, 2024 is a mega election year. There are around 60 national elections being held around the world this year. Uh, we've got important elections, obviously, in the United States. Everybody's looking at that with bated breath. We've got EU parliamentary elections, and we have a couple of uh, three key elections coming up here in Germany as well. These elections are being held at a time when democracy is under immense strain to uh, not least in Germany and in the United States, it must be said. Uh, you may have seen the latest V-Dem 
um, VDEM democracy report. They track uh, how democracies are doing versus autocracies, autocracies in the world. Uh, that report just came out last week and again confirmed the uh, trend toward autocracy and that the number of democratizing countries in the world is declining. Uh, the second thing that makes this discussion timely is where we are in, in, a, in terms of the development of digital technology, because we're at really a, a watershed moment, at a critical moment there. People are inc increasingly inf informing themselves, of course, through digital media, through, uh, particularly through social media, which is awash with disinformation and misinformation, it must be said. Uh, and that's now being turbocharged by artificial intelligence, right? So, uh, and meanwhile, governments are struggling, scrambling to understand uh, how to deal with all of this, the implications of AI, and, and to respond with appropriate regulation. Now, our discussion here today will focus on the United States and on Germany, uh, how these countries can harness the positive potential of technology while mitigating its uh, adverse effects. We'll look at efforts to foster transatlantic standards, combat disinformation and digital authoritarianism, and discuss ways to incentivize, and this is really important because we have strong re representation from the private sector here on this, on this panel, how to incentivize the private sector to play a constructive role in this endeavor and make, make it work for you guys, right? Because you're also at the innovative cutting edge of what's going on. Now, we'll jump straight into the discussion without prepared statements. And as I say, the last 20 minutes, love to hear from you guys. Just to kick things off, I'm going to throw a couple of quotes at you and get you to respond. Uh, the, the first, uh, these statements were made, by the way, over the past two days at the, at the Summit for Democracy that's currently underway in Seoul, South Korea. You guys might be aware of that, that's still happening. Uh, the first quote, and I'm going to get uh, Hannah Müller, Semyon Renz, and Tobias Bachele re to respond to this uh, first. The first quote is from the South Korean President Yoon Suk Yeol. He said, and this is a de summit for democracy, right? Third year going. He said, fake news and disinformation based on artificial intelligence and digital technology not only violates individual freedom and human rights, but also threatens democratic systems, right? He stated it quite bluntly. So my question then to Hannah Müller, Semyon Renz, and Tobias Bachle, how much of a threat do you think that AI and digital tech pose to democratic systems? And we're going to start with you, Hannah. <laughs> I was hoping. Since no. that is your job, really. I know, it? I know. It's your job profile very well. <clears throat> yes, um, I would totally agree. Um, however, I think there are two sides uh, to that. So I think that disinformation, misinformation is probably as old as humankind. <laughs> so. Uh, the topic of disinformation is not, you know, here because we have AI, but of course it facilitates uh, things. And we as governments, um, of course, uh, have to make sure that we are right on track with that. And this is probably one of the challenges we are having. Like, we are not known to be, like, the fastest working <laughs> uh, sector, so to say. Um, so it is a huge challenge. And, of course, uh, the possibility to manipulate information is a huge challenge for us and, and is harming dem democratic uh, systems. Semyon Renz. So overall, I would agree that, of course, AI can pose um, a threat to democracy if used by bad actors uh, with regard to disinformation. Um, but of course, there are two sides uh, on this coin. And um, basically, like uh, as working for Meta, on the one hand, we are investing heavily uh, in artificial intelligence and excellence in this regard. Just in 2024, we will invest 37 billion in developing uh, artificial intelligence. On the one other hand, as you mentioned at the beginning, we are um, providing social networks uh, who can be used for democratic and political discourse. So we have a clear responsibility um, with that in mind, but also, of course, when we are deploying and developing artificial intelligence. Um, I would like to say that AI is both um, a sword and a shield uh, when it comes to um, disinformation. So if you have a look at where our AI program is coming from, it started actually uh, with the idea to tackle disinformation harmful content on our platforms. We have over 3.5 billion people using our services, so artificial intelligence and machine learning tools are essential to tackle these. Um, and that's where the starting point was, actually, sure. for our AI program. That's a huge responsibility. That many people are using your, your programs. Uh, absolutely. Right. 
So, um, but that, that's exactly where the starting point was. And um, there are many brilliant examples of how a AI can actually serve democracies and public discourse. Um, so far, if you look at the elections we have observed um, already in this year, we have not seen any major use of artificial intelligence to interfere uh, with, with elections. That was, I think, reflected also on the panel we just had here before with uh, the president of the BSI. Um, I, I would double down on that, that this is so far the case, but I mean, it is a realistic threat that it will be used. And, and we we're looking at you know, technology, you're talking about elections. Uh, we've already had an election in Pakistan, and we noticed in Pakistan that the government decided to just shut down you know, mobile communications and, and the internet uh, at, a, at a critical point towards the end of that election. So it's just an illustration of how, uh, of how uh, governments can intervene to, or how, the techno how technologies can enable or uh, prevent people from, from interacting. If I may respond Please. directly to that, um, that's of course something we observe, especially around, uh, especially with regard to authoritarian regimes around the globe, that they are shutting down uh, access to internet services ahead of elections. But there are many other uh, threat angles, like hack and leak tactics. Um, we have seen there are. Um, um, uh, uh, attacks on, on media publishers um, like... Uh, sure, of course. Uh, Semyon, I, I, we can uh, get back to this in a moment, but I just want to give everyone an opportunity to kind of you know, kick in here at the beginning and then we can go into more detail. Th thank you. Uh, Tobias Bachele. Oh, sorry. Um, no, let me see. We've got... Yeah, Tobias. Um, well, I would argue probably we're going to talk a lot about uh, the malfunctioning and the manipulation of distribution systems. And I think their AI can be helpful and not so much of a threat. When it comes to uh, gen AI and disinformation, I would argue, yes, it's a problem, but mainly we lack two things, or because we lack two things. And one is transparency. We're still not able to identify um, AI edited or manipulated uh, pictures or completely generated pictures that could be could be changed when it comes to content credentials or something like that, and it could be shown why on is, the platform. Why is that a problem? Because um, I think it's very important to know context and uh, to know that something has been changed, edited. Because if I have an AI-generated image and I know this is AI-generated, then it's not big of a deal. Then it could be satire or could be to illustrate something. So like to if I believe it's opinion. right, if there is an intention to fool me, then that's a problem. And this could be broken by that transparency. And the other thing we lack is a general digital literacy and knowledge of what's possible. Um, and I think this is, this is very important because on the first, first look, um, two, three years ago, when we had first gen AI uh, tools around, the, we had the dancing Putin, and I think no one really believed Putin would be dancing like that, and of course it was also uh, not a really good video and everything, so it was pretty clear. But of course the advancement is so fast that it's really hard for people to keep track and to identify the little glitches um, that often are still involved in those uh, generated above all videos. And I just want to take this to, the, so we, know, we know that that can happen, that there's manipulation, but why is that a problem for democracy? Because in the end, democracies um, run on debate, and uh, those debate rooms need somehow or a certain degree of agreeing on truth and a certain capability, a capability to well, not be flooded by shit. Well put. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Now, um, now, we got the second quote here that we're going to throw out there, um, and it's from the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. You might, might have seen this uh, come through yesterday. Uh, he said, again, in the context of this Summit for Democracy, An author as authoritarian and repressive regimes deploy technologies to undermine democracy and human rights, we need to ensure that technology sustains and supports democratic values and norms. So the question is then, how do we do that? How do we ensure that technology sustains and supports democratic values and norms? Benjamin. Ben. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps two things to that. Uh, first of all, I, of course I would agree with uh, Secretary Blinken. Um, the question is how 
do we operationalize this? Um, from our point of view, and you mentioned that there is a declining number in states that are democracies and a rising number in states that are more authoritarian regimes. So we need to close the ranks in somehow. So we have the G7, we have the OECD, we have established international formats where we can actually put these questions to the floor, where we can discuss and where we can ha actually have conclusions out of this. The code of conduct, for example, on the G7 level is that is a value-based document on how we would like to see generative AI put to practice. Um, so now the second step is how are we going to institutionalize this? What kind of international organization could actually handle this? Might it be the OECD, for example, because those are the open democratic economies. That might be a step forward. But a, a condition to this is transparency and openness on both sides, on, this, on the side of the companies. And you mentioned that uh, I work for IBM and uh, Zemion made the pitch for, for, uh, for Meta. Uh, companies very often, as politicians and governments, by the way, as well, very much focus on the good that they are doing, that they are investing a lot in transparency, that they are investing a lot in transparent systems. But you see that happening? Samuel just made the pitch. So um, I think, and from the and from the uh, from the side of the government, we always say we have the, this regulation in place. We are going to have these kind of safeguards here. These are the international guidelines. But we should be very honest. This generative AI, this discussion around AI in general, is it a threat or is it, uh, is it um, how to say, of value to our societies? That also demands an openness and to be, to be very open to say, this is an endeavor, this is a journey on which we are. We don't know what might be the shortcomings and what might be the advantages of this. And I would like to be I would like to, I would wish for more honesty on, on both sides because that is what we need if we want to have a sound debate among the value-driven partners that we are, especially in the G7. So transparency and some common framework for, for approaching it, plus investment in the positive parts. Good. Uh, Jeremy. Well, I think I would agree with a lot of what Ben just said. I think if, if you asked Brussels, and that's where my role is based, I think Brussels would have a regulatory answer for you as well. <laughs> but. I think the only thing I would add to what Ben mentioned is, you know, there's an important point around access. You need to make sure that everyone has access to this technology. And that doesn't mean providing the bad guys access to the nefarious ways they can use it, but there is a democratizing effect of making sure that the most powerful parts of this technology, in some use scenarios, sure, there may be national security issues around that, but it has a very democratizing effect when you're looking at AI more broadly. We want to make sure that has as much reach as possible. So I think that's an important part. Some might say that even carries risk. I'm trying to emphasize the fact that it's not a good thing if it only becomes concentrated in the hands of a few players in a few markets in a few parts of the world. So I would just double down on the access point. And I do think that when we talk about responsibility, Tech companies have a huge responsibility, but they can't do it alone. So we definitely, and you saw some of this at the Munich Security Conference recently and some of the partnerships that we're striking, everyone has a role to play there. And I haven't heard a lot about education yet, but that has to run in parallel this way. I think the watermarking solutions that we're coming up with, to answer your example about audiovisual content, there's a lot of promise there, but we also need to make sure that as this space involves, we're educating folks to ask the right types of questions when you're engaging with that content. We shouldn't just think we can solve all of it by a watermarking solution. Mm -hmm. Caroline. I think it's, uh, I would underscore also what Jeremy's just been saying. It's, it reminds me too of the discussions we have in other, other fields as, as cloud technologies developed or around um, uh, regulatory standards now globally. We need a industry as much as government needs a level playing field. So we need a, a, some kind of framework. The EU, uh, uh, AI Act is an interesting example um, and, and could become, as GDPR did, a kind of a gold standard uh, for, uh, for the global scene. I, the concern is there has to be a level playing field, there has to be also um, a transparency but, um, and a harmonization. And I think from our perspective within SAP, we're kind of an oddball on, or I'm kind of an oddball on this panel because we work in the B2B world and not B2C. Um, so we have the advantage, I suppose, of working uh, with our own customers' data, which we already have vetted and we know is reliable, and we uh, have to work in a responsible fashion with that data. So it's, maybe it's an easier game for us to play than in the B2C world. But the concern we have is with these uh, kind of plethora of different frameworks that are emerging uh, internationally. So definitely 
as Benjamin says, either within the OECD or within G7, that there has to be a, uh, as I say, this level playing field for AI, just as we had in the past and as you see around regulatory standards or data privacy discussions. Thank you very much. Uh, so we've got a, a, we've set the scene here now with uh, responding to the two strains of our discussion. One is the threats posed, the risks associated with technologies and particularly with artificial intelligence as that is the dominant question that's hanging in the air right now and a transformative technology. The other is how to exploit its, its positive potential and, and use it to, as a benefit for democracy as opposed to something else. Now, I'm going to get, now we're going to get into more specifics. Um, and Tobias, I, I want to start with you. The, you sit in the German parliament. The German parliament itself uh, has been attacked, uh, you know, is un under cyber attack as we speak, I suspect. Uh, and you're still working through some of the things in the past. Uh, Germany is often criticized, also particularly within Germany, for not having the digital infrastructure kind of that it should have to support industry and to support a number of things, including uh, democracy in terms of how people can participate in the public life. Um, let me ask you to how well is Germany prepared to deal with a world that is now turbocharged by artificial intelligence and is driving ahead, leaping ahead with digital technology? How well is Germany prepared for this? Depends. Depends on, <laughs> on what aspect you, you want to look, look on. I, I would say, on one hand, we have... Uh, we have, of course, the issue that we need to modernize our public sector, that there is a lot of uh, data available that, or sh that should be available that is not yet available from the public sector. But also when it comes to data sharing in general, which is in the end fueling AI, there is a huge potential in Germany, but uh, there is little knowledge or experience mm -hmm. in it. And this comes to personal data as well as um, data that is being produced in all the companies we have. We have so many SMEs, which is great, and this is amazing for our, uh, for our economy and also for our social um, structure, but it's, you have a lot of players, you need to agree that they are now sharing data to, to train an AI in their field. And so there we are posing challenges on, on a big potential. On other fields, I would argue, of course, we have the AI Act, which is, I think, a, a strong framework to, to re regulatory framework, of course, uh, to when it comes to deployment of AI. And then we have this very, where I'm really not sure about this, 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 this threat to democracy, the question on how much is, is, is our public debate fueled or manipulated by disinformation, by this info ops, and so on. And I would argue we have incredibly strong actors and knowledge on that, but it's hard for them to get hurt. And it's hard for, for us as a society to have that understanding implemented in all the different branches, in all the different peer groups, age groups, and so on. And I think the idea of lifelong learning is not new to Germans, but in this speed, it's sometimes challenging. And I think this is, this is kind of the biggest challenge we are facing, that people need to adapt to those changes, um, and, and this is an extreme. We're in this process of adapting now, and uh, I mean, the same question I need to put to you, of course, as well, Ben, if you want to respond to, to what Tobias just says, because you're sitting in the ministry that deals specifically with this, trying to support Germany's, the development of Germany's digital capabilities, both for industry and for public, the public sphere. Uh, where, where, do you, where do you see Germany? You, you, you worked for you know, a big corporation before that. You kind of have an understanding of, of where Germany stands in relation to other countries in relation to the US, for example. How do you see it? I mean, I, I can't speak for IBM any longer, but when I was working with IBM, IBM um, decided to invest heavily in Germany. So um, they opened up um, a huge center in Munich, uh, so-called Watson Center. Um, one of the last thing um, I was involved in was bringing a quantum computer to Germany. So um, with regard to how attractive the stand or uh, the the, uh, the market is or um, Germany is in general, um, I mean I, I would let speak it for itself uh, the, the facts here. And I, I think Microsoft uh, has announced also a quite of a, a huge investment in in Germany. So. Um, it's, it can't be really unattractive. Now, looking into the facts, perhaps just 
a couple of things here. First of all, sorry, just uh, yeah, sure. Interrupt, like, Go ahead. Digital infrastructure in Germany is that yeah. like really good? Would Digital you infrastructure. Say? When There's, you look at the facts, I don't when you get look that at, impression. You know? Yeah, I, I know. But when you look at the facts, for example, at 5G, 4G, um, actually, um, we are also um, with the measurement of the European Union. We are um, we are actually in the front runners group in in Germany. So front runner within Europe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Scandinavian uh, countries. It's not. Uh, it's uh, not. I know public services. Is, it's an, uh, It's another story. Um, education, because you mentioned also education. Tobias also mentioned uh, literacy. Um, there's something where we where we need to speed up. But let me perhaps mention one thing, um, especially when it comes to the digitization of of companies, um, of the private sector, because we have one particular goal in our digital strategy that is to provide all sectors, private sector, uh, civic society, education and research with more and better data. Very often I get a feedback from, uh, from companies that they don't know where to look for data, for, for example, for enhancement of their business models or for innovation. Um, and they want the state that the state is, pr is providing more and better data. And they are right, but there are already, when I then mention, for example, that there are already established platforms where data is shared in their constituency. Within, in the con within the limitations of the German uh, pr information privacy. No, 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 no. It's, right. it's not about personal data. This is about, for example, weather data. This is about oh, okay. machine data. Um, this is about um, mobility data, for example, to give you a very concrete example. We have the so-called mobility data space where company can come together, buy and sell, like for money, data, work together or apart on new data-driven business model. But the problem is, and this is something that is perhaps a bit diff difficult to understand from a liberal ministry, um, I need to really also urge the companies to get involved. It's not only the state that has to provide this, it's also the companies that they, they need to get involved. Sure. I know that there are multiple challenges. There's a lack of qualified workers, inflation, high energy prices, and now the German government is coming around the corner saying, please invest in data. So I, as a CEO, I would probably also say that uh, I need to focus on, on like one or two things here. But it's not that there is no data available in Germany. Okay, no, th thank you very much. Uh, the, you know, I th I'm sure Anyway, we, we can maybe pick up on that later. Um, Caroline, your, your company serves clients around the world, right? You, I mean, we talked about, talked about that at the beginning. It's just phenomenal where, how deep SAP is ingrained in the global corporate uh, architecture. How do you, you know, many of your biggest clients are in the US. How do you juggle the different regulatory frameworks when it comes to technology, digital technology in particular, uh, well, just as an example between Europe and the United States. How do you juggle that? Right, well, that's, a, I could just repeat what I said in the, to the first question. I think that is a concern, of course, with these different regulatory frameworks, but um, the, the cooperation is very close. I did want to say, you know, it's not, a, it's not a national game. The technology innovation, we've talked about decoupling and de-risking, but honestly, we've, been, we've become more integrated. It's a, it's a global uh, innovation. It's a, it's a global game, and we can't manage it as one player, either in SAP or just Germany alone, without multiple partners. All the companies that are sitting up here are all partners or customers or, or both uh, uh, in, in one shape, way, one way or another. We also work with the SAPs um, in you know, 120 markets globally. We have uh, in all of our key focus markets, and America is probably still the biggest partner and market for us. Um, but it's the same is true for uh, Singapore, or uh, who's just brought out a very advanced uh, AI governance framework. We have to sit down with these governments and participate in AI ethics advisory committees, uh, in, in, in tech in tech advisory bodies, so we, it's, a, it's a partnership model. It, you can't just see that innovation on your own. W one specific question, and we could do a whole uh, panel on this, but just uh, what about the, this new European Artificial Intelligence Act that was just passed? Uh, that is now going to require that companies respond, start you know, telling the, the commission what they're doing exactly. This is very relevant, of course, for, for Meta and, and Microsoft as well. Um, the, is, is this something that your company is now going to have to like, conform to, and is this, is this a big challenge? This is a moderate, has a moderate impact on SAP, and that's what I said at the outset, because we're B2B and not B2C, so for it, it has an impact on our high-risk scenarios with regard to HR processes or uh, where we, our machine learning solutions are involved. 
um, it's manageable from an SAP. I'm just okay. speaking oh, strictly from an SAP okay. perspective. Good. May I ask a question? Is it mm. triggering innovation? Because you said it's manageable. <laughs> I mean, that is a wrong approach to regulation. It should trigger innovation. It's risk-based. It's not as invasive or burdensome as we expected it to be. And the innovation <laughs> has been happening already for 10 years. I mean, AI has been around for a long time. That should also be, we should remind ourselves, this is not some technology that just popped up with chat GPT. We've been working with machine learning uh, SAP from SAP side for, for 10 years. So the innovation is driven uh, by demand and, uh, and the, the growth of the, of the markets on the uh, IT side altogether. So... Um, <sighs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's a good thing you're not moderating that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I appreciate I appreciate the question. Uh, I, I, you, you guys can feel free to offer questions to your colleagues here on the podium anytime. Um, I, I want to give uh, Semyon and uh, and and Jeremy an, a chance to respond to this kind of this question as well. Um, but. While I'm doing that, I want to, I want to put a question uh, to Semyon, and it's a question that has been around for a long time, but it's now taken on new relevance with artificial intelligence. The ability for for state actors and individual political interests to manipulate information uh, are perhaps being amplified by artificial intelligence. I just want to ask you, how does your company balance the need for content moderation, like in an election year, for example, uh, on the one hand, with the temptation to amplify dodgy content that generates more engagement and hence revenue? How do you balance that? Maybe uh, two points. Uh, first of all, I mean, content which is not of value is not helping us at all. I mean, it's not getting traction. It's creating an environment where no advertiser would want to spend their money. So we do not have any interest in amplifying content which is uh, not valuable. Um, the second one, uh, which I've... There's quite a bit of misinformation out there, isn't there? I mean, a lot of, like, <laughs> no? no let, let, let me uh, no? dive a bit deeper into that. So how we think about disinformation and misinformation, you might have heard about, like, the ABC model. So you can have a look as a company how we think about <laughs> disinformation is. You can look at the content someone is posting. That's the most complex thing, because, for example, in Europe, it could be illegal under the Digital Service Act. It could be violating our community standards. It could be n not violating any of the two, but could be misleading nevertheless. So that's where fact checkers, for example, coming in. But it's highly complex work, because you have to interpret the content. You have to look at the context and so on. So it, this is a challenge. That's why we deploy over 40,000 people in this regard and use AI, for example. The more interesting angles are um, behavior and actor. And let me explain that a bit, because that's also interesting for, for AI. So, while content um, is difficult, as just mentioned, we can look at like, whether an account is authentic, whether the account is communicating with other accounts and spreading content which might be misleading or disinformation. And that is something which is very neutral because you don't need to look into the content. So that's how we detect, for example, Russian-based disinformation. Um, and that is where AI is excellent at, at looking at these patterns of behavior between different accounts on our platforms. And that is where we are looking into, and that's the most important part where AI is actually deployed, as I just mentioned, as a shield um, against such foreign actors. May I okay. also react to Ben's question? Uh, or? Yeah, yeah, very, 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 very briefly. Uh, very Go ahead. No, I, I, I really would want to, and I link it to the security-related question. I think it's a really important point. I mean, f for Europe, what worries me the most is that Europe is falling behind in terms of investing in AI. I mean, in the race, especially with authoritarian regimes around the globe, it is important also to protect our democracies to be a technology leader. And so far, if I look at the global landscape, most of the direct investments into artificial intelligence is in the US at 74%. And just last year, it dropped, I think, from 40% to 9% in the European Union. So it's decreasing. Um, France and just got a boost, right? Sorry? France just got a boost in AI, I think. Yeah, anyway. Uh, but in, in, the, in, the, in the global comparison, that's right. still, still minor. Not much, and let me come to the regulatory um, question. Of course, uh, the AI Act is, uh, is, from my point of view, it's not boosting innovation in Europe. And that's maybe uh, the most important thing that, of course, regulation should also look at this side 
should also enable companies to grow. Yeah. And for us as a global technology company, the AI itself is not that much of a problem, but it's the, the regulatory landscape in Europe overall, it's so highly complex uh, with data protection rules, which in itself is also not a problem. Um, because it makes sense, of course, the GDPR, and there was good intent behind it. But the enforcement uh, of the GDPR, for example, and maybe also with the AI Act, is highly complex between these 27 member states. And that is, I think, thing, think something uh, Europe really needs to work on. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to hear also that, that Meta is still investing heavily in content, uh, you know, screening or whatever, uh, moderation to some degree, as opposed to the platform X that used to be Twitter. There's, uh, you know, there's great concern about what's happening there. So, you know, not all platforms are operating in the same way. Uh, Jeremy Ronson, uh, I, I told it, you know, said I'd bring in another aspect yeah. of your biography uh, here that, that, that is relevant, and, and I'm going to do that right now uh, because I, in reading through your your bio blurb, I saw that you've led uh, public policy and stakeholder, public policy campaigns, stakeholder engagements related to AI, right? So you've been out there talking to people, listening to their concerns, bringing that back in and trying to plug it into your company. Uh, not just AI, but privacy, cybersecurity. I just want to ask you, what did you learn through those experiences with stakeholders and those campaigns? That's a fair question. Um, I still wanted to address Ben's point, but I can do it with your question. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it with your question. I've learned, because all of that has really yeah. happened in Europe. That, that's where I've been based in different companies. And I would say that, you know, with those tech innovation ambitions and leadership ambitions that Europe has, I, I do think if to be successful at AI, European SMEs need to hire lawyers when Californian SMEs are hiring engineers, I, I think you know who would likely win those races. And when you have to, it's early days on the AI Act. I mean, that's the honest answer. So I think it's almost too early to say what yeah. impact this is going to have. But if anyone is spending as much time as we are, you know, kind of now trying to understand, well, what do they mean by this word exactly? Or what does this word even mean? Or how would it work mm -hmm. in this practice? If you think of the attorneys that we have spending time on that, and we have a big company with a big footprint across AI, and it's different. But then you add the Data Act, you add GDPR, you add proposals in which the ink is barely dry. There's a number of proposals there. It's not a question about regulating or not, but the complexity is a question. And I think with your question about pro-innovation, it's about that complexity and how you navigate it. So to your question, when I leave Brussels, I hear a lot of excitement about these technologies. You see all kinds of startups and capitals all over Europe with this new idea of leveraging this or leveraging that or wanting to hire these people or hire those people or work with this or work with that or get bought by these guys or bought by those guys. So the you don't hear the same level of concern that you hear in Brussels. And I think a lot of that is, of course, when you, you know, the only tool you may have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. But at the same time, what have I learned from all of those engagements is there's a lot of excitement around these technologies. There's also a lot of risks, and that is the purpose of regulation, to mitigate it. But complexity matters, and I think sometimes simplicity is you can have just the strictest rule in a shorter sentence, uh, and actually is more helpful perhaps than just the <laughs> complexity that has been characteristic okay. over the past five years. Final, final statement from, uh, from Hannah, and then we're going to open up the floor to questions. Um, uh, Hannah, I mentioned earlier that, that you, before joining the federal ministry, you were dealing, you were working with German, German industry uh, abroad, uh, particularly in Asia, uh, in China specifically. Uh, I wanted, want you to draw on your China experience and what you know about China and share with the audience here your concerns regarding China uh, moving forward in how China might deploy uh, new technologies, particularly artificial intelligence, in the, in the sphere that you're working in now, which deals with cyber threats, et cetera. How do you see that? Do you see China perhaps all, maybe playing a, a positive role? Because we're getting, we're getting some kind of really upbeat you know, assessments here of, of where, where AI is, is, is going, and uh, you know, which is one we like to hear that. China is going to continue to be a big player. Uh, we're seeing it maybe sanctions right now in the U.S. Uh, with, with, uh, in terms of TikTok, the mm. platform. Are we seeing you know, kind of, you know, efforts being made there to, to push it back? How do you see China as a player in this sphere in the, moving forward? So first of all, let me answer Ben's question. No, just kidding. <laughs> 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 I'm not <doing> that. <laughs> um, 
If it comes to China, I mean, th the biggest actor we're dealing right now and we're dealing in, in the past two years is, of course, Russia. And I, I had a colleague um, from Australia who was basically telling me, like, Russia is the hurricane and, and China, China is like climate change if it comes to disinformation and foreign interference. And I think this is true. We are all focusing right now on Russia, but one of the main actors is, of course, China. And if we think about data as being the new oil, <laughs> Um, th then th this is where, where China comes in. And I've been living for quite some time myself in China and, and all the questions and discussions we are having here in Europe and in Germany about data is, is kind of ridiculous if you, if you live there. Um, like every time you, you take a bike or uh, you pay by WeChat, you know that you know, data is there. What concerns me more um, in the field of disinformation and foreign interference if it comes to China is in comparison, especially to other actors, is what you don't see. Um, I mean, Russia is like, um, they are disturbing the information space. They put uh, pictures out of context. Um, they, may be, they make use of, of deep fakes and all of that. Um, we saw a lot as well within, uh, since the 7th of October. We saw a lot of pictures which have been put out of context. China is, is able with AI that you don't see any, so people just disappear. Um, so you don't, you don't have a chance to say, okay, this is AI generated. It's, it's just not there. So I used for industry, and I was at a presentation from Xiaomi, like the mobile phones, and, and they were so proud in order. I was living in Beijing, and, and normally if you take pictures in Beijing, the sky is cloudy <laughs> um, because of the air quality. And they were so proud in order, like, you can take a picture and you don't see that it's cloudy anymore. And, and you know, people were kind of like, wow, that's super cool. But if you think about what that means, if you can just, you know, let, let facts disappear and what that means for the reception of people, then it's really frightening. And I think we should focus more on, on China in this regard. Another uh, panel discussion I see in the future as well. Um, so we're, we're going to open up the floor now. We only have about 10 minutes left. I know that uh, Ben has to go. Uh, he's uh, very promptly. So uh, if um, let's start picking up. I'll pick up two or three questions. Two questions. First, uh, first the gentleman here, if we can get a microphone to the gentleman uh, over there. And then you, sir, we're holding up the pen. And then uh, whew, and we'll move from there. Thank you very much. My yeah, my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm a retired professor. Uh, you mentioned frameworks and guardrails and the G7 and OECD, but Carolina said it's a global problem. Do you see any role for the United Nations? There will be a report from a high-level committee in July, and probably they will propose a new UN organization for AI. Makes this sense? Thank you. So first question about uh, regulation at, at U UN level, and then we're going to, I'm just going to collect two questions and then we can get them to the panels. Was that for any particular uh, panelist or Caroline you mentioned? Uh, any others? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, sir, can you get a microphone to the gentleman in the third row, uh, second from the middle? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm not so sure if there's anybody from computer science on stage. But could you identify yourself, please, sir? I'm Kay Pusci. I'm a professor uh, of business informatics. Um, is there anybody from computer science on stage? No? Um, because I liked what uh, Mr. Bachale said on transparency, but when it comes to transparency, uh, you're pretty much uh, uh, on, in the market see the definition of computer science, which means uh, transparent has to say that the user has no knowledge about where it happens, what happens, and how it happens. Um, so if we look at social networks, for instance, uh, or if we look at AI, we just uh, saw a little surprise with Google's Gemini, um, uh, nobody has the slightest idea how this black box works. Uh, that's not my understanding of Is, transparency. Do you, okay. So. Okay, question about... Uh, what, what do you think is a question? Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> Within the concept of transparency and regulation at EU level. Um, the first question, I think it was directed. We'll, we'll take... Um yeah, perhaps uh, Wolfgang Kleinwächter is a, a long-standing member of the multi-stakeholder community when it comes to internet governance, just to put this into context. And, um, well, we have to wait for the report, but I think it's... Uh, you, me you mentioned one really important thing is that um, especially when it comes to uh, freedom, uh, openness, 
and a democratic and strong internet, um, political decision makers are highly dependent on the multi-stakeholder community. Um, th this is why we, as Ministry of, uh, for Digital and Transport, are investing heavily in the IGFD, um, where we try to help to put this on track again. This is also uh, why we support uh, the, the IGF in general. This is also um, why we um, support European formats in this way. Um, we have, against a very challenging background when it comes to the budget, um, jointly achieved that we have a bit more money for the international community, especially for multi-stakeholders. So to put the, yeah. You win. Yeah, so the UN. I I, we have to await for we have to await for the uh, the, uh, the the um, the document, the report. Um, but I can tell you something. I'm not the biggest fan of parallel structures, and there are established formats for the multi-stakeholders, especially with regard to uh, the internet governance. And we should put our focus on strengthening the existing ones. So a risk of lack of harmonization when it comes to dealing with uh, a regulatory environment. Okay, the second question uh, concerned the issue of transparency. Uh, anyone wish to address that? Yes, go ahead. You know, I think it comes up a lot, you know, and it's come up across a number of these policy files, in fact. I think the transparency that he was mentioning earlier is more when you interact with an AI-generated piece of content, and that's a different type of problem than transparency around models and all of the different ways they were trained and the like. I think it is important to recognize some of the limits there. Like, I don't have transparency in the way an airline is developed, but I have trust in the airline when I step on board that it's been vetted by the right experts with the right standards, with the right scrutiny <laughs> bodies. Recently. So I do think it comes up a lot, but there's different contexts for the transparency, and I think his comment was more about AI-generated images and videos and the like. I think. Yes, yeah. yes, it was, definitely, but I would still argue that transparency is a very high value also when it comes to AI models, although the black box will always remain to a certain degree. I think, um, for example, when it comes to the question of what uh, data was the AI trained sure. on, this is a very important question to ask, and I think there needs to at least to be a certain chance on transparency, at least if we have some problems with the AI, for example, if we have a bias. And also the documentation on the bias needs to, to be transparent to a certain degree. Um, and, and I need to take the opportunity to, to one, because Meta did uh, us a favor on transparency in algorithm, although it was a very bad idea what they did arguing that they are downgrading or taking out political content on the on, on their on the on the feeds um, and I think this is very important to know if I interact not only with an AI generated image but also if I interact with the platform because I need to know to a certain degree why a platform is pushing something and why it's not pushing something. And in the end, this is also a matter of power balance, because I, as an individual, I, as a politician, I might have access to a certain knowledge and to a certain capacity, my team, and maybe also state capacity, which is not as much as other companies have or as other database-driven um, institutions have, but it's still more than individuals have. But we all need to understand on what playing field we are doing our discussions. And Great. therefore, the, the idea of transparency, I think, um, comes in, in handy on, on, on many, many, many perspectives. Samuel, give it, please respond. Yeah, just to add on that, I mean, uh, transparency is, of course, key. And to, to praise some uh, German regulation, I mean, the German Interstate Media State Act, uh, Medienstaatsvertrag, a very German acronym, um, that actually tackled a couple of years ago exactly that, demanding transparency on how algorithms and social media work. And I mean, that is something we voluntarily implemented, for example, because it is a good idea to have this transparency to a certain degree. As, as Jeremy said, it, of course, needs to be reasonable and understandable, understandable for the user um, and shouldn't be too complex. And that's always a difficult balance to strike. But the general idea is absolutely right. Maybe one more question, and then we're going to have to wrap it up, because I know Ben has to catch a plane. Uh, sir, back in, yep, there we go. Thank you. Yeah, my name is David Schmanko, working for TÜV Nord, and I want to pick on something uh, Semyon said earlier about GDPR implementation uh, that, in his opinion, doesn't work, and maybe a question to all the private sector representatives, whoever feels <laughs> they want to answer. Uh, is if you now have the AI Act being being implemented, 
and what would maybe your be your wishes towards the representatives of uh, of politics uh, what could be made what should be made diff or done different in implementation in regards to like oversight that we don't have this many like implementation issues that gdpr posed big topic kind of opening up here in our last two minutes um uh, but would anyone right. care to make a very quick uh, statement about that yeah i, I can quickly. make that i mean as i said for me it's not about like one single law uh, gdpr is just an example of where uh, the enforcement is very different from france and within germany i mean we have 18 dpa data protection authorities even within the states it's very different from time to time and how they enforce the gdpr and the reality, and not just GDPR, many other laws uh, in the European Union have the same development. So it is very often not possible to scale as a startup in Berlin to, for example, Lisbon. And that is a problem in the digital single market. So there's a lot to do in this regard. Uh, and as I said, it's not about the GDPR itself. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, um, uh, the regulation. But it needs to be really fully harmonized in the European Union, also when it comes to enforcement. Thank you very much. Uh, a warm round of applause for all of our speakers. We're going to have to wrap it up here. I know Ben's got to catch a plane. I, th I think we've learned a lot today about the risks and opportunities and the challenges that we're all facing moving forward, dealing with new technology and particularly with artificial intelligence. Thank you very much to all of you. And thank you also to the Aspen Institute for hosting this important session. Thank you. Thank you.